way of explanation, this is meant to be a bit of an untalk, sort of just as, as the Berkman Center has been pioneer in the unconference format. Uh, basically, yeah, I was I was asked to do a lunch, I don't know, a couple months ago they scheduled me, and I realized last week when I was asked to give a little blurb about what I was going to talk about that everybody here is probably pretty sick of all my usual subjects. <laughs> and I've given various presentations and so on about Global Voices, which is our citizen media project, and have done a lot of talking about uh, Chinese internet censorship and corporate responsibility and so on, and that I, I didn't really think it was the best use of anybody's time for me to run through all that stuff again in this particular venue. Um, but one thing that I thought would be interesting would be to to really be selfish and and pick your brains, um, and and tap your experience on how best to teach journalism, particularly focusing on the internet, in this age where I think a lot of us are very skeptical about the quality and purpose of mainstream media today what it is that people ought to be learning, and so on. Um, it's pretty interesting, actually, that I'm actually about to become a journalism professor because throughout most of my journalistic career, I was pretty dismissive of journalism schools. Uh, I would often, as, as bureau chief in Beijing, we would get a lot of young people who would come and approach me asking for jobs, internships, and so on. And people, of course, coming from a variety of backgrounds. And to be honest, I never really saw what, you know, some of my applicants would be journalism school graduates or journalism school students. Some of them would be people who were teaching English in China. Some were people who just kind of showed up and had some variety of background. Um, of course, I did require some language experience, but I didn't find necessarily that the J school students brought any particular value add. That it was more the practical experience of people that really mattered, and their street smarts, and a whole range of things that it didn't seem that J schools were necessarily all that good at teaching. Um, just kind of the, but and and also sort of the 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 ability just to kind of do as an intern assignments that weren't necessarily glamorous and you know that you weren't going to be on CNN immediately and so on. So I've always been very skeptical of journalism schools and kind of wondered what their point was if I had not found J school students to have much value add. Um, but as I left television and mainstream media and started playing around in this new world of blogs and what we're starting to call participatory journalism, where uh, you are, where, where a journalist who is going to be innovative and effective really has to be quite fluent, I think, in using the web living on the web and also very open to interacting with the public in new ways. Um, I started noticing some interesting things. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's about my age, maybe a few years older, um, who's a journalist, who's, freelance, who's been a freelancer but is trying to get a full-time job with a media organization again. And this friend of mine pointed out that there's this very interesting thing happening in the field of journalism these days, which is that news organizations increasingly are looking for young, web-savvy people who can really do new things and take their organizations in new directions, or they've got sort of very senior staff and that they're not really hiring people in the middle, people who've been out there for the last 15, 20 years just kind of filing their stories and doing their beat but not really having paid much attention to all the new technological developments that are happening. And this friend of mine, you know, who's about my age, 
was lamenting her sort of lack of marketability these days. <laughs> and, and that there's this real kind of, shall we say, leapfrogging that's happening with at least some news organizations in terms of hiring, that younger web savvy people are being hired pretty quickly out of journalism school and put in positions that in the past they would never have been put in because they're not afraid of the web and people in their early 40s are. <laughs> and or we're, we're speaking in general terms, obviously. But uh, th the other thing I noticed talking to a lot of people was that, and, and also in some things I read, was that news organizations actually are hiring a lot of J school grads who have internet focus. That this is actually becoming a real demand. And that a lot of news organizations don't know where else to, to find these people because since everything's so new, it's there's a very limited number of people who have the practical skills that they've developed on the job. And and so people are really tapping right into journalism schools and grabbing people who know who know how to do web pages, who are familiar with the technology and who are familiar with doing journalism on the web in, in new ways and, and just kind of not afraid to experiment. So, th so that I found to be very interesting and made me think, well, maybe there might be a point to journalism schools. Um, despite the fact that actually some some other people I know, and including one person who's the dean of a journalism school who's about to leave this journalism school quite soon, has been complaining that they are training young people to do serious journalism, to do serious investigative journalism, how to do really quality work. And they train these students in this way with all the right values of what journalism is supposed to be. And they're unable to get jobs doing that type of journalism. Doing it, there, there are just so few jobs that really give the reporter the chance. So I'm, I'm kind of talking in contradictions a little bit. There's a lot of contradictory trends going on. That, but you know, you, you teach somebody how to do really hard hitting TV documentaries, and all they can do is get an infotainment health beat at, at CNN or something like that. You know. And 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 so there's there's always this problem that that there's a disconnect between what journalism schools are teaching and the demand of the industry in terms of quality journalism. Um, and of course, with the citizens media movement and and a lot of other experimental efforts, there's. Part of the reason why the blogosphere has grown is, is because people feel dissatisfied with what mainstream media is offering and are seeking alternatives. The question is, is there, is there a role for, for journalism students or professional journalists in that world or not? And, and this is also another big question that's, that's really unanswered. And so just really thinking about what is it if we want, if, if we think that there's a role for professional journalism in our society that's important, um, if, if we think it can't all be done by amateurs, and if, if we think that probably some combination of the two, citizens media and professional media, is likely to be the way to go, what should we be teaching the next generation? And, and, what, and to what extent should journalism schools be taking the lead in innovation? Because another thing that we've seen is that a lot of news organizations are looking for new ideas, are looking for new ways to apply technology in covering the news. One would think that a lot of R&D should be coming out of journalism schools. Um, and Dan Gilmore has written about this, and some other people have written about this. But we're see seeing very little in terms of partnerships between media companies and journalism schools in terms of developing experimental techniques or tools or 
anything like that. And, and again, why is that? And what might people start to do to try and move it in that direction, maybe taking some, uh, maybe looking, borrowing a little bit from what has successfully been done in the software industry or computer science departments and companies or something like that. Um, it would be interesting to know. On, on another side, um, one very interesting thing about where I'm going to be teaching is I'm, I'm going to be teaching in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong's an interesting place because it is a, you know, <laughs> autonomous region. It's called a special autonomous region of China. And China and Hong Kong have this one country, two systems formula so that technically Hong Kong's uh, legal system, political system, and so on was to remain unchanged after it was handed over by the British to China in 1997, for 50 years at least. Um, and Hong Kong has always had a fairly <coughs> relatively free press. It's it's completely different structure. On mainland China, you know, you have the party secretaries in the in the newspapers and, and TV stations. You have very tight control. You have ultimatums going down about what news organizations can report and what they can't. Um, Things are opening up a bit. There's more more free market, but there's still tremendously heavy censorship and so on. The internet, as our colleagues have documented extensively, is heavily censored in China. It's not in Hong Kong. Yet at the same time, because most media organizations in Hong Kong are owned by people, are owned by multi sort of these these conglomerates with business interests in China. There's tremendous actual pressure on the news organizations and the journalists to self-censor. And so we're seeing that increasingly a lot of the local media are not going after certain hard-hitting stories, are not covering certain things, and so on. And that there are some blogs who are starting to try and fill in this niche in Hong Kong. <coughs> but it's still fairly limited. And one example that I thought was 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 kind of perfect was there's this Hong Kong blogger named Roland Sung who writes a blog called East South West North which um, is really kind of required meeting for, reading for anybody who follows China and uh, he wrote about how he was coming back from a hiking trip on Sunday and he ran into a huge demonstration um, it seemed to be thousands of people from what he could tell and this wasn't reported anywhere in the Hong Kong media. And there didn't seem to be have been too much sort of blogging or sort of internet coverage of it either. And so then the question is, how can one, uh, I mean, this seems to be really low hanging fruit for journalism students <laughs> uh, in, in terms of there's lots of things to cover in this very small place geographically that uh, is not being covered well by the mainstream media. Legally, it's not illegal to cover this stuff. It's just that the big media corporations with their financial interests in China don't want to because <laughs> it's not in their interest. So it seems like there's a great deal of low-hanging fruit to get students involved with some very interesting <coughs> citizen media projects um, which could <coughs> help to publicize what's going on, but also maybe to, to help develop smaller niche types of media models that that might be sustainable perhaps as, as even businesses or something. And and so how one how one goes about that. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of what I'm looking at and, and, and some of the questions I'm facing going into this is, first of all, how to prepare young people for new kind of journalism that is the kind of journalism that we think they should be doing. But at the same time, how do you equip them with skills that actually result in jobs? Um, 
and and how do you also manage their expectations whereas if the real kind of journalism that we've taught them they should want to do if it becomes impossible to do that kind of journalism in an existing media organization should we be teaching them to be more entrepreneurial about creating new types of organizations or, or, or finding finding completely new solutions um, and again how you do that in a realistic manner is is also an interesting question what types of businesses or organizations outside the university should one be collaborating with et cetera, et cetera. so anyway that's that's just uh, I'm gonna open up to questions and maybe target a few of you um, individually but I I sort of as as I've been putting together my, my first <laughs> class that I'm gonna be teaching in in the spring is this new media workshop basically which I've, I've kind of put up my draft class schedule on a wiki and basically th this this program for the master's students it's like a one-year program they don't put people in track so they're not tracking them out to say you know you go into the broadcasting track and you go into the magazine writing track and you go into the internet journalism track that's what they do at like Columbia journalism school you have to choose a track and you have to decide what kind of journalism you're going to do which strikes me as kind of really outdated way of doing things in this day and age <laughs> but that's what a lot of journalism schools do fortunately this is a new new enough program they're not doing that and it's small enough and so they're basically requiring people to take a bit of everything and then they do a final project in one medium or the other or some combination thereof and and they're meant to be fairly versatile and and flexible in that regard I think also assuming that that it's more about the mindset and kind of the journalistic values that you're teaching rather than necessarily specific technical skills which are changing too fast to really be <coughs> worth paying tuition to learn <laughs> at a journalism school um, so so yeah and and in this class I decided what I was going to do since it's supposed to be a workshop a lot of lab and so on um, again, not to focus too much on, you know, here's how you build a website with Dreamweaver and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, learn how to use HTML perfectly, uh, but really get people blogging right away and reporting on what happened in each class, reporting on each other's reactions, subscribing to everybody's blog. I mean, I won't kind of go through this in detail, but but really to to start getting the students right away used to the idea that it's not just about you know you put something out there people read it and that's that forcing people to link to one another create discussions but also to use their blogs as a way to invite the public into helping them do their research for their stories and and actually um, for the masters for those people who do a new media master's project for as their kind of final thesis they're going to be required to use a blog and potentially a wiki to engage people outside of the school or just other people in the school or you know other people in you know okay I'm doing a thing on waste management in Hong Kong you know can anybody give me their local stories in their neighborhood and you know this kind of thing and and to, to learn how to use this the various participatory medium in in sort of fluent in in a fluent and natural manner and to, to really start out that way and so the the class is, is going to be very much oriented towards you know kind of doing little mini papers on their blogs but then also reacting to each other's mini papers and and doing presentations some podcasting using Flickr YouTube tagging so on um, etc so that's pretty much I, I won't drone on and on but I'm, I'm interested in any reactions and suggestions people would have I'm a little leery because I'm coming from a practical journalist and, and sort of project running person's perspective rather than a teaching perspective I'm fairly new to teaching I think I'm very likely to over assign way too much work. 
not necessarily on the reading side, but more on the stuff that people have to do per week kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in people's reaction, both students, in terms of what you think would be engaging and, and what you think would really help people learn, and, and also people with teaching experience in terms of how do we best engage a class when I guess the, the goal of the class is, first of all, to have students come out with a clear understanding of what's the difference between doing journalism on the web versus just doing stuff on the web, i.e., you know, creating cool, cool shit and, you know, impressing your friends with all the cool stuff you put on the web or chatting on the web. What's the difference between journalism on the web and chatting on the web or just online diary on the web, you know? so that people have a clear sense of that and and also a clear sense of how how you do you do that journalism in new ways and how you teach yourself new tools and and how to think innovatively and creatively <laughs> and just not be afraid of learning new things um, and uh, what else yeah I guess that that was Pretty much, I think those those two things, just in, in, in terms of less about, you know, I know how to do a web page using XYZ tools, but more about <laughs> level of comfort on the web. Um, the other thing, actually, it's, it's interesting, just on a footnote, that I've been hearing from some people who run news websites for news organizations is that a lot of news organizations have really good web 1.0 websites, mm -hmm. you know. Um, like I, I heard this from somebody at CNN, he says, you know, our, our, our site was really great in the 90s. It was really cutting edge. <laughs> um, but one interesting thing, and, and, and I found this too because with Global Voices, and we're, you know, we're a WordPress blog, we've just hacked the thing, it's, it's all open source, it's all, all just kind of playing around. Our, our WordPress content management system can do more, more flexibly and creatively than Reuters multi-million dollar, you know, custom content management system can. And, and so this kind of goes to show where things are headed. But one thing I found very interested, interesting in working with news organizations is that a lot of the people in the web teams and news organizations you know, they're trained in web 1.0 they you know they know their content management systems and their tools but you know you talk to them about rss and and it's really kind of disconcerting to them because it's not the way things are done you know and i get a sense from people who are in top management in a lot of news organizations that they're recognizing there's a disconnect between what's going on there with YouTube and Delicious and Dig and you know all these great new sites that are really innovating like crazy and no innovation is happening is coming out of their web teams like zero and they're having to buy these other things because their web teams aren't innovating and so there is also a real need in news organizations and I think increasingly going to be a demand for people who are really fluent in 2.0, not just 1.0. I mean, whether or not you like those terms, I, I find it useful to differentiate between the web of the 90s that news organizations are pretty good at now, and the web of now, which the the you know the living web, which news organizations aren't very good at. Um, so anyway, yeah. Well, the one thing I'd say though, I mean, I used to work at the New York Times website, mm -hmm. um, and I think the everybody would like to be more 2.0 and everybody understands 2.0 but institutionally it's really difficult to do it yeah. it's just there you know all the new york times content comes from a content management system at the paper right. that is it's not dumped th that's dumped in and, and right. you can't make that 2.0 just yeah. with a, a click, a click yeah. of a switch you can't and and you know you can't put it all into wordpress because it's all in right. some Foreign, you know, different yeah. content management system that IBM built 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, it's it's the sort of in changing the institution is the hardest right. thing for the existing news news organizations. I think. Right. Yeah. And and this this kind of points to where, you know, how news organizations mm -hmm. report the news and in what format, and whether, 
also over time it really makes sense to be sticking newspaper content on the web or, or whether you need to completely rethink how you report based on what works on the web and then how that inter, in, interacts with your non-web product and, and so on and so forth. But uh, man, I'm interested in hearing from you guys, <laughs> having heard this random picture that I've painted. <laughs> What 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 do you think? What what is your advice? I mean, what what's your advice about what I should be teaching people who are going to enter into this position where they might know a whole lot of stuff and they can't really implement it when they go work for a company because their their boss is going to be well, you know, that's really nice, but you know, it's just completely not how we do things here, you know, or something like that. How do you prepare people for those? Yeah, kinds I mean, what should roles? or you know or or, or give them impossible assignments I mean, there, and then change the assignment at the last yeah, minute. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think this is one problem that a lot of journalism schools are having, in that they kind of they're teaching journalism as the way they like it to be, and then people go to news organizations and then they have to work in the way it is, and. It's very interesting to see what happens because a lot of graduates will then be extremely dissatisfied and, and maybe not interested in sticking around long enough to wait till they get to a position of seniority enough to, to change. Or, you know, there, there's all kinds of different things. But um, I, I think the biggest disconnect between what you, you know, um, the kind of skills you can teach a, mm -hmm. a young journalist and the way it works in a news organization. And whether you're, I mean, when I was in college, I worked at the New Bedford Standard Times, you know, a much smaller place. And, um, you know, they're the same institutional issues. I mean, that's a Dow Jones pa paper in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And, you know, putting the web, putting the, publishing the website is um, just, they're the same kind of constraints you have imposed by um, the, the company. Um, mm -hmm. You can't, and I think it's sort of the trick as a, Journalist is trying to figure out how to do creative things within those constraints. Right. And figuring out how to, you know, yeah, I don't know, take risks and, and experiment. Mm -hmm. Maybe experimentation is the biggest, figuring out how to experiment is probably the most important thing for, yeah. I think. So you think if, if one is just teaching, you know, giving people like a good sandbox where they're not worried about constraints, just becoming very comfortable with experimenting. <clears throat> That that would be, and and then they're going to go hit reality, but they'll just have to deal with reality. But the, it, it, at least they'll right. they'll be equipped to be creative. Um, do, do you think that's a, a useful approach? Yeah, I th yeah, I think, yeah, I, th I think experiment experimenting is the biggest, the most mm -hmm. important thing. I think. From a teaching standpoint, I mean, you've already identified the hardest thing, which is you've got way more cool, necessary, important stuff to cover than you can ever possibly hope that students will have time to do. Right. Um, and so how you select the key pieces that are going to most fundamentally advance whatever you decide the you know core lessons that you want to get across are is, is the trickiest part. Um, and just looking at part of what you had further down on the, the uh, wiki, I mean, I think given that you are teaching a very practical subject. I think mm -hmm. you're exactly on the right track to try to build in as much of the, the learning, whether it's studying model, other models, uh, newassignment.net, you know, just hundreds of other models to see what people are doing or whatever it is, rather than just having those B-reading assignments and things that people talk about, trying to build as much of that into their actual exercises. So blogging about that, reporting on it, uh, synthesizing that, so the more it's all built into practical exercises that, that build the skills of journalism mm -hmm. while also getting them to focus on reading about and studying everything else that's happening in this new space. seems like a great way to pull those two together and then you you kill a couple of birds with one stone. You still have way more birds than you could ever stone, but at least right. you get a few more that way and you do it in a pretty practical uh, way. So. Yeah. I really like your idea of you know, trying to get them to go out and kind of do field work online. And I think that's something that should definitely be emphasized because there's a lot of people who know how to make stuff online. Yeah. Not a whole lot. Like people are much worse when it comes to doing research online. So 
having them kind of, I don't know, maybe you can make an assignment to infiltrate a community of some kind uh, online <laughs> infiltrate? and gather, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, kind way. of like insider work, but yeah. the online equivalent. Yeah, go into a, go into a forum some and start forum, interviewing people right. and find your story ideas and then because go offline and pursue it. until you become yeah. like part of the community. Right. right? So it'll be yeah. Assignment. Yeah, that's, that's a really sort of interested to hear your thoughts on like what I see to be a sort of basic tension between citizens media and the practice of journalism mm -hmm. because journalism sort of attracts people that want to have voice but that want people to know that it's their voice yeah and you know especially in the context of places like China it's it's you know you have a billion more than a billion people you mm -hmm. want to be different but I mean it's also an oppressive regime and the the sort of uh, the sort of anonymity that mm -hmm. the citizens media has is attractive. Mm -hmm. So, how do you sort of reconcile wanting to be a sort of prima donna journalist, but mm -hmm. also living within the constraints of a regime that will put mm -hmm. two kilograms of C four under your you know your seat and blow you up if you say something that they don't want? To <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. But it happens in Lebanon. <laughs> it does happen in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and that's what's going to make this, I think, teaching in Hong Kong really, really interesting. Because a third of my students are going to be from mainland China, a third are going to be from Hong Kong, and a third are going to be from random other places, you know, around Asia. And, you know, there's even a few Americans who just, you know, want to learn journalism in Asia. And and actually, I'm, I'm going to do, uh, the way I've drafted my this is a, it's like a 12 week semester. Um, I'm going to spend, I think, one class looking at the Hong Kong situation specifically and the interaction between professional and citizen media, and one session looking at Chinese situation, <coughs> mainland China specifically. And the, what, what I'm thinking of doing at, at the moment is, is in our lab to do some very specific exercises on use of circumvention and anonymity tools because frankly I think people who are working and living there as journalists need all journalists need to know these tools and I'm pretty shocked at how many journalists working in that region know nothing about any of these tools um, well, that's kind of an aside but yeah um, this is definitely a tension I think with all media and citizens media any, anywhere, where I think a, a lot of journalists would just like to be able, it's much easier, you do your story, you have control over it, it has your byline on it, it goes out, you, you get kudos, everybody you know, says, oh, you know, so-and-so from the New York Times wrote such and such, isn't he cool? And, and it has a big impact and you know, causes some policy to change and you can take credit for it. And you know, I think that's, that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the 20th century kind of journalist dream way that it, it works, or kind of ideally the way it works. And we are shifting into a new paradigm where it's just a fact that, you know, you can't, as Dan Gilmore likes to say, you know, it's it's no longer a lecture. It's 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 a conversation now. And, and right. your audience often knows more than you do about a lot of things and if you're not <coughs> enabling them to participate in what you're doing but somebody else is the audience is going to go over to that place and increasingly be hostile to you because you're not listening and reacting and talking uh, you're just lecturing and, and I think in, in an environment where everybody's lecturing that's fine but where some people are lecturing and other people have gone beyond lecturing to the conversation, um, the audiences, and again, you know, we don't really know where everything's going, but it, early indications are your website is more sticky, you, you develop a community around a site where you're not just sticking content out there, that you're, you're involving your community of readers, audience, whatever, viewers, and so on, and that that's that's just kind of where it has to go if your news organization is going to survive in the long term, and you're just going to have to be perhaps a little less of a prima donna about everything going through you. Um, 
but this I think also goes back to what are the fundamental values of journalism and what is the point of journalism because you know I mean I, I when I was in Beijing I would sometimes have these kids walk into my office and you know how do I get on TV and they obviously had no interest in actually in <coughs> journalism per se they just wanted to be on TV and be famous and influential and and that's kind of the most extreme thing but but basically if, if you're going into journalism to be famous and just kind of be important in my view you're going into journalism for all the wrong reasons you know and and there, there are plenty of people who do go into journalism for that reason um, but you're better off just you know go into you become an actor or something you know or you know get get on some reality show and become famous or I don't know you know emulate Monica Lewinsky or something but but uh, yeah, yeah. We'll coach on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know if, if you want to be famous you know don't come work for me I, I mean that that's I, I had some conversations with people that were practically that frank, you know, that that um, the real point of journalism, and I think what the public ultimately would like journalism to be, is to serve the public discourse, and and to serve the public with the information that citizens really need in order to make informed decisions about all aspects of their lives. And so, are you serving the public discourse better? by lecturing and by having full credit for, for that lecture? Or are you serving the public discourse better by stepping aside and saying, well, here's a bit of what I know, but so-and-so, you know, who's, who's the garbage collector down the street, you know, he has this to say. I step back, let him say it. Um, is, that, is that serving the public discourse that better? You know, and, and I think ultimately that, that needs to be the measure. Now, in more repressive societies, obviously, then that then there's the whole anonymity issue, and and I don't think that citizens' media equals anonymity. Um, right, just, you know, I, I think that if you're if you're in a if if you're in a place where you have basic protections on freedom of speech, and if you're doing anonymous citizen media, um, your credibility is going to take a massive hit, and I think people are coming to understand that. Now, if you're in a place where Having your identity known can get you in jail or get you blown up. Obviously, that's a completely different dynamic, and I think audiences will take that into account. But one thing you're you're actually seeing, like in China, which is very interesting, you're seeing some very interesting teamwork happening between the blogosphere, the Chinese blogs, and professional journalists. And a lot of professional journalists have blogs, sometimes anonymously, but they also have relationships with various bloggers. And so what will happen is, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff that they can publish, which is fairly prescribed. And then there's all this other stuff that's just not getting into their stories or it's not getting on air. Um, and they kind of either put it on a blog anonymously or they give it to a blogger who, who gets it out. And this kind of thing. there's always the whack-a-mole with censorship and all that kind of thing. But it gets out that way. And, and, and there have been a couple of instances of cases um, where you actually saw a change that resulted from momentum being built in the Chinese blogosphere and attention being brought to things that just wouldn't have gotten the same attention if it was just kind of left to mainstream media alone because they feel so because they are kind of powerless on a lot of issues and and so yeah I, I, I think and if if what you care about is journalism for the right reasons I think you applaud that and you know you work with that and you see bloggers and, and sort of anonymity strategically used as your ally in serving the public discourse. And so, but but it, I think I think one will have, there's some very interesting conversations to be had with young Chinese journalists 
about how to nav navigate all of this in a realistic manner. <laughs> you know, because the other thing you want to do is not to uh, overinflate people's expectations so they end up going to jail when they hadn't really wanted to. You know, there, there's a difference between people who are like, I don't care if I go to jail, and people who think that they've insulated themselves enough, but then they were kind of misinformed. You know? So so that's always... Um, well, uh, we are... Uh, I was a part of a project in Brazil that we call Vermelho. It's a... It's a uh, uh, English... Uh, it's a journal on the internet mm -hmm. uh, based on Web 2.0, actually. And that allows people to vote what news they want to Mm. So, but what is the point of this project, actually? It's uh, the, the major in Brazil, regarding newspapers, they only cover news from Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, that is the mm. and do not, so the main thing, they do not cover uh, news from the Northeast, from, and even cultural news, news that people are interested in. Mm. So this, this project is based on this these holes that the major do not uh, cover in the in the main right uh, yeah and the good point of this is that it it, it has been a huge success so the majors want to buy the content mm -hmm. from this project but as it has a creative common license non commercial we are trying to so I think it's these barriers of the all of all these changes it will make really good new opportunities to yeah. develop new models new business models based on the, the, the open journalism, the system journalism. And in my country, uh, if you can see <coughs> about Hong Kong or about China or here, what is the, where are the holes in the society that are not covered by the, by the majors? And then take this opportunity to, to build. But at the same time, I think it's important to show the students the realistic factor that, okay, during the day, you are looking for a job in a major because you have to survive, mm -hmm. and during the night you are doing another kind of stuff for fashion. Yeah. But in some years, can give you money because it's a new and I think a new <coughs> model. Mm -hmm. So do you have you have Arabic journals that you put material there, and then you can and <coughs> the majors like your photo, or <coughs> you can buy pieces of this material. So there, are, I think there is a lot of space to to make models to be developed in all this, and this. And even in, in a country with a lot of democratic problems like China, so they have a lot of space to try to build all, all, all this new space that the majors do not cover. Mm -hmm. So uh, Brazil, uh, it, 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 it really, it's really good that there is a lot of projects in Brazil are being built exactly based on these goals that, and I, I'm not here with my computer, but I have data regarding the decrease of the sales of the major journals Standard Sao Paulo is the biggest one in Brazil. Uh, so it's a decreasing. People are looking for other sources of news. And this legitimate sources has a remaining or other kinds of open journalists are increasing. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a huge change that can we <coughs> take advantage from this new yeah. material and sources. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely. I think the challenge is to encourage people to yeah. figure out how to innovate and to find these opportunities and also find a way to make a living at the same time. <coughs> yeah. You don't, you do not have a lot of job opportunities in this company now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the students must, uh, at least in Brazil, <laughs> so students must uh, have the opportunity to compare models from abroad all over the world, yeah. and then say, in my reality. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And even if you are uh, worried about my name, can if, if my name is going to appear there or not, uh, for example, there is uh. a huge database of historical data from the history of Europe hmm. that the science, uh, the social science university that is related to the university I work, they are trying to build. So uh, we are trying to build a wiki for them to hmm. work, but then you can put your profile there. Right. So all the scientists are involved to this project. Wow. So 
your name is going to be connected to the project anyway, but the project is for the good of the public. Yeah. You know, so there are main, there are, I think there are models that can uh, relate the two interests. You know, mm. the public interest is, and I have to, to, to put my name there to maybe get a job in another major. Yeah. Know, this, this is my oh. life objective. You know? Yeah. No, yeah. But what, what do people think? I mean, borrowing from other industries um, where you have more cooperation between, you know, companies, nonprofits, investors, and student work um, and research. What's the best way to kind of go about saying, okay, we're going to encourage students to come up with some of these ideas that fill these niches um, because increasingly, and, and we're seeing this too, I think, in, in data that's coming from media markets around the world, that it's niche media that's really actually kind of niche and specialized media that's increasingly making more money than, than general media um, or is doing a lot better. That's kind of where the growth is. Um, so, so how do we, how does one structure a situation in, in, in a university setting where you're encouraging students to kind of come up with these ideas, to start working on them, to show that they have something there, and then try and get funding or grants or a relationship with some media or software company? How, how does that, how might, again, since I've, I've not, done that I mean I've, I've, I've started a nonprofit thing myself but how does one structure an environment for that to kind of happen well that is the structure of most academic research departments right and I don't know much about journalism schools however it sounds to me like these people are paying to go to your school right and so is there such a thing as a PhD in journalism because a PhD mm -hmm. is, is a research degree and it's and, and it's during that research because, I mean, it does seem like you're very invested in the idea of fomenting novel approaches. And that is, I mean, research at its core. And so I guess I don't know. Maybe the question you should be asking is to your future university. Right. Because people don't want to necessarily pay to do this. They want to get paid to do this. Right, exactly. You know, even if it's a yeah. pittance. Mm -hmm. you know, even if you're a graduate student at Harvard or right. you're a graduate student at MIT, you get a survival wage. Right. But it's you're investing your time and you're going to reap this later and you're actually it's it's a phenomenal opportunity to, to harness the irrational exuberance of youth and you know right. send them off on these exactly. ideas and so what i don't know is if you're mm -hmm. you know i was curious i mean it sounds like your main responsibility is teaching mm -hmm. but do you also have um additional time mm -hmm. to develop a cohort of either peers or students or fellows i mean it sounds like you want to start the berkman equivalent in Hong Kong, where you have the funding to bring in people to let them to explore new mm -hmm. things, and yeah, that's a really good question. Um, they do have, I think, a very small number of occasional PhD students. It's it's a fairly new program. It's only like six years old, so mm. they're they're still kind of getting going on that. Although I sense that they take the more traditional social science approach to research, which is you write a really long paper, right? Um, <laughs> And, and that's your research, um, which in this... But that doesn't seem incompatible. It's, it's not incompatible, but, you know, the question is, does it need to be a bit more kind of lab-oriented, as it were? Um, right, well, at the end, more, I mean, at the know, end, if you, if you send someone off yeah. into a lab, be it, um, you know, be it a social science lab or a, mm -hmm. or a physical science lab or a biological science lab, they do all kinds of stuff. Right. And all kinds of stuff comes out of it. And, you know, this is actually something that I'm interested in is, like, you're generating vast amounts of data that end up living on the web. Right. But you still, at the end of the day, have mm -hmm. to look at it and think intelligently about it and say something about it or else nobody's right. going to necessarily care. And right. so, so I was, I don't know what the journalism is. This is funny where term, the journalism mm -hmm. literature, mm -hmm. you know, is there, are there the journals of journalism? I don't sure, know. There, I there imagine are. that there yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, it seems like those are the places that you want to report your results. Right. Yeah, 
and you want them focused more on innovation right and the difficulty rather than just on documenting what people are and doing the difficulty is, is the metric of success now. in those situations yeah. i think is how yeah. do you how do you judge when a project is meritorious as yeah. like you said so it's like is it just cool yeah. or have we actually done something, a, I've done something. Yeah. you know because yeah invariably right. when you're in a a thesis writing situation mm -hmm. Yeah, someone has to pose a question, you know, and and then what a, what a PhD is, you learn the ability to answer that question mm -hmm. in a in a respect in a given field, and so yeah, how does I, I and this is my ignorance in the social sciences, how does one pose a question mm -hmm. in journalism and then go about answering that right. question? Yeah. And so what is the metric for results? Because if, yeah. if it can't be like readership or something. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because I think up until now, generally in sort of media studies <coughs> and journalism. And, and this is why sort of traditionally I haven't had that much interest in like ever going for a PhD in journalism because I felt I was learning more and being more useful to society by doing practical things rather than getting a PhD in journalism because it's such a social science approach. It's kind of like, you know, you do a, uh, a degree on, I don't know, history or political theory or, or something like that where there's it's more just kind of documenting what's going on in a particular thing and, and maybe so, saying something new about it. But again, I'm not a scientist at all, but I get the sense that original research and, and theses in the sciences do require some kind of innovation or discovery of something mm -hmm. new, right. something that's going to advance the field so that like in practical terms, new things can be done. Yes. And from everything I've read in kind of the journalism media studies literature, there's very little of that kind of focus. And, and, and it's more just kind of, I don't know, documenting something that hasn't been documented quite as fully, but, but not necessarily tied to what can the news industry then take away and, you know, or, or could some company be formed around this or sounds like something like this. And so it, it sounds like, I mean, it's, it's very interesting I'm sorry, go ahead. I want so I want to get it. I right. I'm not sure if I disagree mm -hmm. or I think we're a little bit on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. I think that so the, the at least the the banner there says undergrad, masters and diploma. Mm -hmm. Um I think that the majority of the students you're going to be working with are not there to become right. published in no, journals about journalism. That's right. Oh, but they're there to the, learn yeah. to be journalists, right? Right. And so I think that For with the them part. you yeah. focus on student media empire. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you build Yeah build there's a niche right if they're, mm. they're not if there's not honesty in reporting right yeah. because there's self-censorship there's build an honest for, if the students are interested yeah. if they can if they can handle it yeah. build that off that you can hang all kinds of different you know approaches yeah. to doing it but then mm. they're learning by doing and they're working with these new mm. tools and they are proving that yeah. model the industry is not going to respond to a journal right. about mm -hmm. journalism. The industry is going to respond. No, the to industry a proof. pays no attention. The industry to any says of that you research. get a million hits a month. Yeah. I will. I'll buy into that yeah, model. Yeah. And then yeah. I think. So I think then there are the few doctoral yeah. students, and then there's you and right. your colleagues, and you report and you do your analysis mm -hmm. and evaluation and your academic work yeah. on that those uh, exercises yeah. on what's happening in the industry. But mm -hmm. I think that that's by and large reserved, mm -hmm. not for most students. Right. Maybe a but, few but select for, students. But, but the student, the yeah. majority of the students, mm -hmm. the engine, yeah. are doing this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, going back to what you said at the beginning, yeah. you know, you, and you kind of fall into the same trap as the current journalism schools, right? Mm -hmm. Is they, they trained for journalists the way they want it to be, but it's not. And you're mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm going to train them the way that I want it to be, but it's not. The mm -hmm. difference is, is that, that this may be the future. This may be the right. way it becomes, right. whereas it ain't going to become the way the journalist schools or journalism schools are doing it now. Right. And the models, the, the current models, as we've Absolutely. heard in, whether in Brazil or in Boston or anywhere, mm -hmm. um, the current models for newspapers for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the very least are, mm -hmm. you know, dying, right? Yeah. So there's going to be a new model and you're going to have the people who are conversant yeah. with these tools and, as you pointed out, kind of willing to experiment. Yeah and try new things yeah. and to create new models yeah. and then to be able to adapt to whatever situation they're put in recognizing that who the hell knows what situation they're going to yeah, be in. That's, I, th I think that's, that's a really good way of framing it. Although I, I would say it is interesting the degree to which the mm. industry has no interest in what academics who study journalism are writing or doing. Zero interest. <laughs> well, you said they hate, um, if they don't like J schools, you know, why would they listen to yeah, professors? Yeah. And, and whether, you know, if, 
is is there a way for it not to be the case um and given the lack of innovation happening in the news industry maybe it's changing now a little bit but you know would would there and and i guess my question is less about what i because i think what you just outlined is what one should be doing like this year and next year and so on but thinking kind of i guess more broadway broadly um is is just the the social sciency approach not necessarily the right approach for day schools in the future and should they be taking more of a kind of hard science computer science kind of model in the way they or or some kind of hybrid in in they in the way they approach their function or or is is that uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just, just throwing a, a, a question out there. I mean, without a doubt, your your first priority is to the people that are paying right. the bills that are paying to be there. But you know, I mean, one can yeah. I, I I think that I think that bigger question is an interesting one, mm -hmm. and it sounds as if I mean, and may, again, I don't read the journalism literature, but it sounds as if maybe the the journalism research, the media studies, journalism studies maybe has sort of fallen into one of those academic cul-de-sacs and it, it's one of the, it's, it sounds like maybe it's ripe for, you know, a paradigm shift, you know, sort of an intellectual invigoration of that. But again, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. I just know that, that's that yeah. I just know that That's this happens in science all the time. You know, yeah. like, this yeah. happens in science all the time. In, in fact, you know, there's yeah. murmuring in physics right now that, mm -hmm. you know, what have we done? You know, people <laughs> people have followed <laughs> string yeah. theory so far, and <laughs> and it's gone. There's you know, yeah. Smolin. I guess Smolin's has a book out now about you know, it's like untying the knot. It's like, you know, the fields get very wedded to their own internal consistency, right. and they just yeah. keep following that. In, in and the then, yeah. you know, then something just out of left field comes, and then it really revolutionizes it. So maybe this is a situation like that. If yeah. you're willing to listen, right? But you may, the field Oh, may, but the, the resistance. Field may, oh, the resistance. Like, no, 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 no that's off nothing. The, oh, that's yeah, crap. the resistance right. is off know? the charts. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, everybody that's currently writing in those journals, you know, I, I, have, a, I have another friend who, who just, you know, complains that, you know, she doesn't have, there aren't the right people to read her grants because uh -huh. she's like the only one pushing this, yeah. you know, and, and the, of course the great analogy was, was Einstein is that Einstein was at some university I, I, in Germany and the faculty just full on admitted that they didn't have the expertise to judge his thesis. And, right. and, and so, so not, not that perhaps you're an Einstein, maybe you are, that will, that will become, <laughs> that will become clear, but you know, it, it just, it sounds like an exciting time, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and, and I guess that, that does come down to why I'm doing this at all, having been so skeptical of journalism schools all my life, is, is that it does feel like it's at this point of paradigm shift where one could, as one might say, cause maximum trouble um, or maximum disruption. But Colin had his, his hand up. Yeah, I mean, I'm a graduate student at Emerson College right now, mm -hmm. and it actually seems like it's way more exciting to hear you as a future professor talking about how are we going to use these new web tools mm -hmm. when I'm like at a school trying to find who the professors are that are teaching these new web tools. So, <laughs> I mean, I also think it's there's a certain amount of catching up to do. Mm -hmm. you know, we might just be in this time where, you know, there are professors who are there are instructors who are a little bit older, not using these tools, afraid of these tools, mm -hmm. and a newer generation that's more comfortable with these tools, looking for ways to use these tools in an educational setting. So yeah. there may be that kind of, you know, chasm yeah. also. Yeah. Well, I have a question for you then, because because this comes up a lot, where even people teaching new media find that a lot of their students know more than they do. It's kind of a, a, a a variation on Dan Gilmore is my audience knows more than I do. And and so especially in new media, probably in everything, but especially in new media, should should professors be taking a much more participatory approach and allowing the students to teach each other much more than they're doing or finding new ways to bring in the knowledge that the students have that the professors might not or the skills into the class 
and if you have any thoughts about good ways of doing that. Well, I've had one conversation with a English professor who took like a digital storytelling workshop with mm -hmm. other educators. Mm -hmm. And that opened up their eyes to possibilities of using just even video blogging, say, or you know, digital storytelling. Mm -hmm. There needs to be still so much education among teachers, instructors, professors about these new tools. That yeah. seems like the big hurdle. Yeah. Um, that if you can just, you know, push your colleagues to be um, start a WordPress.com blog for yeah. free and yeah, just yeah. start blogging and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, start editing a wiki and have fun with it. You yeah. Know, like these kinds of things, like get hooked on these new tools. Yeah. Get excited about them so then you'll say, oh, you know, and then you'll bring them and find creative ways to bring them in the classroom. Because there's also, it seems like, this exciting point in this vagueness that there are opportunities for professors to kind of push the envelope a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of introduce something into a course that they may not have done before. So mm -hmm. there's like, this is what I'm seeing, this is kind of what I'm advocating for and pushing for hard, like with my own instructors in my own classes, and they're kind of like, okay, yeah, maybe we will try video blogging in this class. You know, I've yeah. never done this before. And next thing you know, everybody's like, what's video blogging? And what's a wiki? And next thing you know, we're doing a collaborative movie making project in yeah. one of our classes just yeah. because somebody was open to an idea to, yeah. to try things out. That's a really good point. If, if I can jump in too, uh -huh. um, I mean, I think, I think it's important too that, because I, I work mostly with young, you know, high school, middle school, mm -hmm. and so they use all these tools, but I think what's lacking is their understanding of the, like, the thought behind them and how sort of the change in, in collaboration and participation mm -hmm. that these sort of signify, and so I find like people, like most people have blogged or read a blog or something like that, but they don't really know how, why that's very different, and I think I've seen some professors, I took a class where, you know, they wanted us to blog, but people never really got point, past the point of just posting their own entries. They never got to that point of why blogs are interesting because you can comment on other people's and you can start a blog roll. And, and so I think, I was, as, you know, as you're kind of talking about what you're doing, is that there's sort of a lure to be like, oh, these great technologies and this is a new tool. But unless you're kind of talking about the philosophies behind mm -hmm. why they were developed or how yeah. they're different than, than the, the old tools, you're just yeah. going to be using like blogs as another PowerPoint or another. Yeah. You know, yeah. Tool versus a way to change a process of. Yeah. Can, can yeah. I ask something? Mm -hmm. So that, I, that's a really interesting comment. One of the, I've looked at this with uh, primary, secondary school teacher, mm -hmm. high school teachers, um, and certainly the cases. I mean, it's always the case that the kids are going to know how to use the technology, if not at the beginning, by the end, much better than the professor or the right. teacher, whatever. That's just a given. And the cases mm -hmm. where that where that causes trouble is for the teacher who can't deal with losing what they perceive as losing control mm -hmm. to the class. And that that imbalance in yeah. knowledge, right, that asymmetry drives them crazy. But what they where they don't lose it is exactly where you're pointing out. So I think that what you do is you mm -hmm. let loose the reins, you know, yeah. who knows about video blocking, teach us. Yeah. And you point, you know, you make your, you know, you, you let go of control of the class and you point, you make your point mm -hmm. that the audience knows more than you do. Yeah. But you use what you know, which is a contextualization, which says, hey, look, I may not know how to you know, do this, but mm -hmm. I know where this fits. Yeah. And that's where you really deliver your value. So I think that's a really yeah, fabulous that's a really, point. And really people good aren't point. going to graduate school to learn to blog. Yeah. No. Yeah. Learn to no. blog exactly. for free. Right. You know, right. a lot of money to learn to blog. Yeah. And they didn't go to graduate school to kind of learn the frameworks and the theory, and the theory mm -hmm. that they can't do that, but just kind of try it out. Right? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really, really good point. Yeah. You're in a real conundrum, and, and uh, it's not just you, but the school in general, mm -hmm. when you're trying to train people for an industry that's in such flux. Yeah. And you personally could go a lot of different directions and not bear the whole moral burden of the whole thing, but <laughs> I, I mean, no pressure. It, it's, a, it's a tough thing. You should, I mean, rightfully, the school needs to teach people to be ready to work for the New York Times or be ready to blog and really do the right thing and not get paid anything and go find a job somewhere else. And it's it's a tough thing or somewhere in between. And uh, God, who knows what to do with that. I think I think you'll need to teach people to be flexible yeah. and ready to do a lot of different things. 
Yeah. And you might end up, journalism school might end up being teaching people not to write stories, but being able to filter stories mm -hmm. and produce that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that class exists or well, sort information of, yeah, theory and those kinds and, of things. But yeah. yeah. But increasingly, yeah. And and I'm hoping we'll do a bit of that. Yeah. I mean, I think doing really good blogging, that's basically what you're doing as well. You're, you're filtering um, and, and right. context, contextualizing right. to a certain extent. But, but uh, the question yeah. is, how far do you go with computer science? I mean, are you going to yeah. be, are you going to be having people write algorithms for yeah, sorting well, through stories? Yeah, um, well, since I can't write an algorithm, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so yeah. I'm going to have to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess at, at least the first time around, um, well, we'll have to see because I'm obviously I'm coming from a a journalist's perspective rather than a geek's perspective, and and I think. I myself will have to be very open to there's going to be people there who are going to know how to do things I don't know how to do sure. and and how to bring that in and uh, figure out, yeah, exactly to what extent do we have that manpower to do algorithm writing, do databases. Mm -hmm. You know, database journalism is another new field of journalism that right. that certain news organizations are starting to starting to get good at which I don't think is taught very much. Um, and that's another area that I don't know that much about, hmm. um, you know, in terms of actually implementing. Um, but again, there is a computer science department, so maybe there are some interesting collaborations that might go on there. Um, but I, I agree, yeah, that, that <laughs> it, it, it was really interesting actually when, when um, when I was at this, you know, the, the Knight Foundation has this Innovations in Journalism Award thing, and Global Voices ended up winning, but actually... Ended up winning. What, yeah. very, actually, I thought, the grand prize. I, I thought some of the <laughs> other projects, in terms of what they're doing kind of with computer science, at that in, intersection of computer science and journalism, was really fascinating. There were, there were a couple projects that were database-oriented, and that required a lot of special coding and this kind of thing. Um, and they weren't as sexy because they didn't have Chinese dis dissidents and, and, and so on, you know, and, and, and uh, African aid workers involved. But, but in terms of what they were doing in terms of innovation in that space, I thought was really important. And again, you kind of have to reorganize the way you have your department set up to, to really teach that effectively because most journalism professors I mean, not only are they afraid to blog, but they really can't code. <laughs> and they really don't know the first thing about algorithms. And, and so, yeah, how, how do you rethink really fundamentally what you're doing? Um, it's a really good question. Definitely not something that one starting out professor is going to change overnight, but... Uh, <laughs> Last question. But, yeah. um, so I, I think what you're really touching on is a kind of a technology adoption curve. Mm -hmm. and it's inevitable that the New York Times and all these other sites will yeah. be Web 2.0 at some point. Right. When they might Web be on 5.0 by then, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But, but what I think that, you know, is really interesting about these new video programs is that you can show how we currently and economically can condense what would take, you know, a talking head, a camera person, and mm -hmm. a satellite truck yeah. down to one person, a student, one student with a, a camera cell phone, phone yeah. and, and maybe a laptop, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And very, very economically. And I think that's really like the, yeah. the strength of the kind of programs that you're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. The the sort of the journalistic power of the individual. Right. And eventually, yeah. all these things will come into play, like knowing how to blog and RSS. Mm -hmm. That will eventually help, I think, in journalism students mm -hmm. in the future, or depending, it could be the near future if they go to work for, you know, maybe a more hip company. Mm -hmm. The New York Times, yeah, it might take 10 years before mm -hmm. you know, this technology is really Yeah, available. but at least having the, the comfort in operating on the web to be able to say that they know how to do basic things, it, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like it helps people get hired at this point, you know, that, oh, yeah. that having those skills, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much. Thank everyone for your participation.